George Monk was born at Potheridge in Devon on the 6th of December 1608. He was the second son of one of the oldest families in the county, but one which had fallen on hard times. Like many impoverished gentry, Monk was pretty much forced into taking a military career. His first actions were with English armies and were universally unsuccessful, with failed attacks on Cadiz and La Rochelle. After these debacles, fighting for his native land, Monk spent the next decade, rather ironically in the light of future events, fighting for the Dutch. By 1637, Monk was a lieutenant colonel, but he fell out with his Dutch paymasters, surrendered his commission and returned to England. The return was fortuitous. Political and religious tensions were peaking in England and soon erupted into the so-called Bishop's Wars. As an experienced soldier in a largely unmilitary land, Monk found himself in demand. The wars were disastrous for the English, but Monk was one of the few who distinguished himself. Lack of money caused the army to be disbanded, however the continuing political instability ensured Monk was not unemployed for long. A rebellion in Ireland in 1641 led to a new army being raised to suppress it, and Monk was made a full colonel. Operations in Ireland were initially fairly successful, but faltered when the English Civil War broke out. Monk, like many others, thought it best for the English army in Ireland to remain neutral, but King Charles was desperate for troops and eventually managed to move them to England. Monk initially refused to swear allegiance to the King and was imprisoned in Bristol, but eventually agreed to support the Royalist cause, just in time to be captured at the Battle of Nantwich in 1644. Senior prisoners were commonly exchanged at this time, but Monk was so highly regarded by the parliamentarians that they refused to do this, and he was detained for two years. After the collapse of the Royalist cause in the First Civil War, Monk accepted a commission from Parliament to command in Ireland. Monk served so faithfully and successfully in Ireland that Oliver Cromwell gave him leave to raise his own infantry regiment to serve with a parliamentary army that successfully invaded and conquered Scotland, or at least the southern bit, in 1650. When war came with the Dutch in 1652, the English were desperately short of trustworthy naval commanders, and Monk was made one of the new generals at sea, who were pitted against what was then the foremost naval power of the time. These generals at sea were all competent practical men and proven warriors, but most had very little sea experience. Generals all at sea would be a better description. Numerous anecdotal tales illustrate their shortcomings. One general at sea, on sighting a Dutch fleet, gave the order to right wheel and charge, and had to be tactfully informed that a squadron of ships could not be operated like a squadron of heavy cavalry. Another, when coming on deck, heard sailors shouting starboard, starboard, to avoid an obstruction, and was so impressed with what he took to be military fervour that he loudly proclaimed that, yes, he would soon be starting to board them, which meant that he was ignorant of a very basic nautical term, which is a bit of a problem when you are in command of a fleet of 60-plus warships and over 10,000 sailors. Monk was one of the few generals at sea who really shined. He had done a little sailing in his youth, but his main advantage was his humility. Ships at the time were really run by warrant officers, navigators, sailing masters, boatswains and so on, and captains, if they had any sense, would lean heavily on their recommendations. And like most gentlemen of the time, Monk was fully prepared to both humbly ask for and accept advice from them. It wasn't ideal, but it did work. Monk had one other advantage. He might not have had much maritime experience, but he did know a lot about guns. His various military excursions had by now made him an artillery expert, and his deft application of firepower easily made up for being consistently outmanoeuvred by the more skilled Dutch admirals. After General at Sea Blake was taken ill, Monk took over sole command of the English fleet and won the Battle of Scheveningham, also known as the Battle of the Texel. With the Dutch war successfully concluded, Monk was appointed military governor of Scotland and was not unpopular given the circumstances of his employment. The secret of his success is he was firm, but also fair. He continued to remain very loyal to Parliament, purging all opposition swiftly and without fuss. In 
It was also about this time that Monk married. His bride was a widow called Anne Clarges that had been courting for some time. The daughter of a London farrier, she was far beneath his social standing at a time when such things were very important. People looked down at her and derided and made snide remarks about their relationship, but George didn't care. She was the woman for him, he loved her, and that was that. Meanwhile, Parliament may have won the English Civil War, but he was struggling to win the peace. The newly declared Republic had lost control of the army that had forged to defeat the King, largely because it had run out of money to pay for it, and political and religious radicals had seized control. Strongman Oliver Cromwell managed to hold things together by declaring a protectorate, with himself as Lord Protector, King in all but name, and Monk duly transferred his loyalty to this new regime. The warmth of the relationship between Monk and Cromwell is surprising. They were very different characters, but there it was. In 1658 Cromwell died and was succeeded as Lord Protector by his son Richard, and Monk duly transferred his loyalty to what he considered the legitimate succession. However, Richard Cromwell, known as Tumble Down Dick, was not the kind of man that made a good leader, and recognising this had the good sense to resign the protectorship and retire from public life. This unfortunately led to a power vacuum with various factions struggling for control and a descent into political turmoil ensued. Army Republican radicals instituted military rule, began to oust anyone suspected of disloyalty and made up and dismissed parliaments at will. Under the pressure, law and order started to break down. It was then that Monk acted. As the effective military supremo in Scotland, Monk had a substantial army under his command, one that was disciplined, experienced, and most importantly at the time, well paid. He led his force southwards, restoring order as he did. The Republican faction in London panicked. Their own forces were outnumbered and unpaid, and they melted away in the face of Monk's veterans. On the 2nd of February 1660, Monk's army occupied the capital. The radicals surrendered or fled. Monk was now the single most powerful man in England and could do pretty much whatever he wanted. Many expected that he would declare himself the new Lord Protector. Most at least thought that he would take the opportunity to enact petty revenge upon his enemies. So what did he actually do with all that power? He voluntarily gave it up. Well, first he restored order in the capital, then he sent an invitation to the exiled Charles Stuart, eldest son of the executed king, inviting him to return and take the throne. He then organised fresh elections for a free parliament, one that swore no oath of loyalty to anybody or anything. And then he stepped back. Modern historians cynically question whether the policy was initiated by Monk as opposed to merely following majority opinion in England, which by now was overwhelmingly in favour of reinstating the monarchy. But this doesn't seem to fit. Monk was no politician, but he must have known he was arguing to reduce his own power. It's much more reasonable to say that he realised that he was not the right person to lead the country. Monk believed very strongly in the community of the kingdom, as expressed by free and open elections to a parliament. He had always been against arbitrary rule, whether imposed by a tyrannical king or a mob of radical religious fanatics, or, as had been happening recently, military diktat. Besides, the Declaration of Breda, issued by Charles on the 4th of April 1660, outlined the conditions whereby he would assume the throne, was largely based on Monk's recommendations. It was a model of moderation. It promised a general pardon for every action committed during the civil wars, apart from regicide, it promised religious toleration, it promised to pay off and disband the troublesome army. It promised that all contracts and property exchanges carried out during the period of the Republic would be honoured. Parliament duly agreed, and Charles Stuart, soon to be Charles II, entered London on May 29th, 1660. Monk was given the title of Duke of Albemarle and appointed to the Privy Council by a grateful King Charles, who seems to have seen him as a kind of father figure. However, Monk wasn't very active as a counsellor. He was given land in America, Albemarle Sound in the Carolinas is named after him, and he also became a shareholder in the Africa Company, 
a rather shadowy organisation, dedicated to seizing a slice of the increasingly lucrative West African trade routes, at the time dominated by the Dutch. This commercial rivalry was a major factor in causing the Second Anglo-Dutch War in 1665, although at least Monk was honest about the motives. While others airily talked of alleged Dutch atrocities and sovereignty of the seas around the British Isles, Monk bluntly cut through to the heart of the matter. What matters this or that reason, he rather caustically remarked, what we want is more of the trade that the Dutch now have. To reiterate, he was not a politician. Monk was now in his mid-fifties and suffering from numerous illnesses, so he took a back seat when the Second Anglo-Dutch War broke out. Instead of a military command, he took up administrative duties at the Admiralty. This was the year of the Great Plague of London, and while most of the government fled to Oxford, Monk characteristically stayed in the capital, gaining much respect for doing so. For the 1666 campaign, Monk was given joint command of the English fleet, and despite of being initially heavily outnumbered, managed to hold the Dutch at the Four Days Battle, arguably the greatest sailing ship battle of all time. His bold aggression on the first day caught the Dutch off balance, even though the attack ultimately miscarried. His careful husbanding of his injured ships over the next two days was masterful and certainly minimised English losses. He then got his revenge in another big battle, the St James Day fight, the following month, inflicting huge casualties on the Dutch for little English loss. This was Monk's last active military command. He was recalled to help restore order after the Great Fire of London in September of 1666, and when the Dutch raided the Medway the following year, probably England's greatest ever naval defeat, it was Monk who was given command of the land forces that ultimately prevented complete disaster. For his many services, Monk was made First Lord of the Treasury, what we would now call Prime Minister, but he was by now very unwell and realised the job was beyond him. So, once again, he gave up power, retired and lived quietly for the rest of his years. He died in January of 1670. He was just shy of 62 years old. It's quite a career, and it highlights a range of very admirable personal qualities. Integrity, bravery, loyalty, humility. Monk was a believer in the supremacy of love and marital fidelity in the face of bigoted social norms. He was an excellent leader, firm but fair, with a genuine desire to serve rather than to rule, and a heartfelt belief that government should be consensual and not imposed by force. So how come so few people have heard of General George Monk? Well, a lot of it is down to timing. Monk lived in interesting times. The 17th century saw the English Civil War, the Restoration, the Great Plague and the Great Fire of London, all major events featuring a plethora of larger-than-life characters. A selfless, unassuming person like Monk tends to get lost in contrast. Then there is an accident of history. The principal commentator on the period is, of course, Samuel Pepys with his famous diary. Although he is best known today as a social commentator, Pepys' actual job at the time was Secretary of the Navy Board. Basically, he was one of the five people who essentially ran the English Navy. One would have thought, therefore, that he would cover the Anglo-Dutch naval wars in some detail, and specifically Monk's substantial part in these operations. Unfortunately, Monk and Pepys didn't get on very well, and Pepys spitefully makes few references to Monk in his famous journal, and most of them are negative. The third fact that made people at the time dismiss Monk was a personal characteristic. He wasn't the kind of person that made a good first impression. He apparently spoke in a very slow, dull, monotone voice that made people think he was coarse and unintelligent, when in fact he was anything but. As a result, people had a tendency to underestimate and disparage him, especially if their acquaintance was fleeting. It's all very sad, because we are talking about a man who was by any standard a genuine hero, not only for his military successes against the country's enemies, but because by his actions, both the divine right of kings and the mob rule of radical republicans were refuted in favour of a constitutional monarchy with freely elected representatives of the people, the great compromise that made England thrive in the next centuries and under which we still live to this day.
So next time you are chary about having to go to an election station and dropping a ballot box into a paper, remember it's better than having a king lordly declare your actions or a soldier forcing you to do something at the point of a gun at the behest of some ideologically infused fanatic. And if you are tired of lying, grafting politicians, think on George Monk. The best leaders of a country are the ones who don't want the job. Thank you.